Welcome to Dishing Up Nutrition with licensed nutritionists and dietitians from Nutritional Weight and Wellness. We explain the connection between what you eat and how you feel. Stay tuned for practical, real-life solutions for healthier living through real food nutrition. Slow down, you move too fast. Well, welcome to you Dishing to Up Nutrition. Last. Just down. Brought to you by Nutritional Weight and Wellness. It's great having you listen today because we are going to have fun. Yes. So, you know, each and every week on Dishing Up Nutrition, we bring you information about how what we eat affects your health. Over the past 17 years, we've talked about how your food choices affect your risk of getting heart disease, how your food choices affect the, your risk of getting cancer. That's kind of interesting to think about that in itself. Mm-hmm. How your food choices affect your brain and your memory and your mental health. Yes. So I think our food has to be a little bit better right now. So, you know, we also look at how your food choices affect your hormones, how your food choices affect your blood sugar and your risk of getting type 2 diabetes. So, you know what I just said? It's all about your food choices. All of the above. Yes. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Right. And today we're going to talk about how your food choices also affect your vision and your overall eye health. And I think a lot of people don't think about that I at agree. all. No. So stop for a minute and think about this. Have you ever thought that what you are eating affects how well you can see? Most mm-hmm. people have not made that connection. But it's, it's pretty interesting. So our goal today is to help you make that connection. So I'm Darlene Kavist. I'm a longtime nutritionist. And over the last, oh, 20 years, 40 years, I could almost say 80 years, (laughs) I've been talking about the harmful effects of eating excess sugar. You know, the harmful effects of eating processed foods and the harmful effects of using refined damaged fats. All those things should be out of your diet. I think many people are getting the message now that processed foods are not heart healthy, processed foods do not support brain health. Processed foods can upset our digestive system. Processed foods reduce our immune system. And processed foods are making two-thirds of the United States population overweight or obese. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? It when is. you hear about hear those numbers, it's really unbelievable. So here's a comment from my sister-in-law. She said, when I go to the grocery store, over and over, there's more processed foods. Mm-hmm. She said, it's hard to find real foods now. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. interesting. And a lot of people feel that way. Mm-hmm. So, but, but who has connected? I should have said this a, a few minutes ago, a few minutes ago, um, but who has connected sugar and bad fats to those eye problems? You know, my clients and friends are always surprised when I tell them, in order to avoid cataracts, or slow down the growth of cataracts, as you grow older, you need to reduce the amount of sugar you're eating or cut out eating sugar altogether. If you really think about it, cataracts and cataract surgery, that's not really any fun. Right. So we don't want those. No. In addition to cataract and cataract surgery, very serious vision problems such as macular degeneration can also be connected to your food choices. And this may be new information. Most people believe macular degeneration is either a genetic problem or an age problem. And they actually call it age related, related macular degeneration, a as, mouthful. As, which is a mouthful. <laughs> so, but it's not, we're going to break this down because it's not necessarily related to age. So this morning, we are going to have a very special guest, and we're going to have a discussion with Dr. Chris Kenobi, who is the author of a fascinating book about the connection of eye health in our diet. So joining me, and you just heard her voice as our co-host, is Joanne Ryder, who has at least 30 years of experience as a nutritionist, dietitian. She is a true believer in the power of eating real food because Eating real food has helped lots of her clients and maybe manage a few of her own personal health issues. You know, Joanne spends her days working individually with clients either on the phone or on Zoom. 
and also teaches a lot of our classes about the benefits of eating real food. So great having you here, Joanne. I know that you're just filling in this morning, and we're glad you are. So thank thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. It's good to be here. So introduce our guest a little bit for us. Yeah, thank you. And I've been looking forward to this show. Oh, good. I was looking forward to listen to it, but now I get to be part of it. (laughs) So before we turn the mic over to Dr. Kenobi, I want to read a supporting statement about his work. Ed Bennett, who is the president of of, of Price Pottinger Nutrition Foundation, said Dr. Kenobi's thesis that macular degeneration is due to dietary causes is well supported by research. That's interesting, isn't it? It is. Mm -hmm. It is. And we don't have a hard time believing that. No. <laughs> some, some people out there do. Um, but that the diet is a major culprit in the proliferation of not only age-related macular degeneration, but most likely for many other degenerative diseases of c- civilization as well. So things like every um, everyone knows heart disease, diabetes, cancer, all of those diseases are connected to diet as well well we know it but i'm not sure how many other people really truly know it you know right so you know we're really big fans of dr Kenobi's work because he makes the connection between the standard american diet and to many of the vision problems people are experiencing today Mm -hmm. that's kind of interesting too that's right so dr Kenobi, thank you for joining us today on dishing up nutrition we hope you're on the line. Thank you, Joanna. Yes. It's <laughs> Thank good you. to be here with you. Thank you. So you are an ophthalmologist, and you wrote the book Ancestral Dietary Strategy to Prevent and Treat Macular Degeneration. That's a long right. title. It is a long title. It's a very good book, though. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I've looked through it. So Dr. Kenobi, as you know, this is a radio show about nutrition, so how did you, trained as an ophthalmologist, make the connection between the foods people are eating today and the variety of vision problems that you're dealing with? Sure. So, well, first again, good morning, <laughs> good morning. Dara, Joanne. And, good morning. And thank you for having me on your show. I'm glad this is radio because it's early. For, I'm in Colorado, so I'm an hour behind. Oh. And, 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 you know, it's nice I'm not on Zoom. I don't have to look right. <laughs> oh, yes, you I know. know. I'm trying to compete with, compete with Albert Einstein for my hairdo. This oh, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me get to it. Okay, so... Let me tell your audience, you and your audience that what brought me here really uh, to make this connection between uh, you know, man-made processed nutrient deficient and toxic foods and macular degeneration is my own suffering. And I'll spend 30 seconds hopefully telling, telling you this is that I suffered with arthritis uh, quite severely and it's something I'm still mm. working on to this day. But mm-hmm. this is, this And you're is, a young uh, man. Well, yeah, well, it started when I was about 34. I'm going to turn 60 this month. And so, really? But, wow. Yeah, but I... You look good. But, <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I, you know, I've been, I've been working at it. But anyway, so I had this... Um, I had struggled with arthritis for 16 years. And when I was 50 years old, which was, again, almost a decade ago, I, um, I uh, learned briefly about the paleo diet. Anyway, I made some changes in my diet and in... Uh, something like eight days, my arthritis was 80% better. Oh, wow. And it was wow. just so, I, you know, if I had time to tell you, this was so incredibly life, life-changing life for me that it put, sent me down a path of trying to understand nutrition. And what I learned in the next couple of years was, you know, from about 2011 to 2013, I learned a lot about nutrition, um, but... I did, really didn't understand it until I came across Weston Price's research who connected these processed foods to all of this degenerative disease like dental decay and arthritis mm-hmm. and cancers and, you know, metabolic disease essentially. And, and then um, – and so that gave me a framework to understand this. And it was in 20, late 2013 when I began to understand – and your audience will probably already know this, that these man-made processed foods, essentially sugars, refined flours, vegetable oils, and trans fats, that these, these are the foods driving 
all of this chronic westernized disease, we call it. Now, that really means, you know, that that, that term may not mean uh, a, a lot to some people, but it really, what it means to us is everything from heart disease, hypertension, stroke, cancers, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, in other words, lipid disorders, you know, visceral obesity, uh, insulin resistance, um, and, you know, then overweight, obesity, uh, um, what am I missing? Alzheimer's, dementia, <laughs> even the autoimmune disorder. So I started right, understanding yes. that all of these are being driven by by processed foods. And so it hit me that could macular degeneration, age-related macular degeneration, be caused by the same thing? And that was 2013. Mm-hmm. And I began to investigate that. And, and literally, for it took me about a year and a half. I was still in practice. And by early 2015, I was convinced that that hypothesis held water, and I left practice to, you know, uh, investigate this, to research this full time, and we came out with that research in 2016. Eventually, published a paper, and I started a nonprofit foundation because the hypothesis was supported by the research, and and broadly, uh, you know, we looked at 25 nations around the world, and their their processed food consumption using proxy markers of sugar and vegetable oils, which are huge parts of the of the processed food components, as you know. Yeah. And that research strongly supports the hypothesis. And I will just say that in a nutshell, though it is processed foods driving age-related macular degeneration. So, Dr. Kenobi, you know, uh, I have a friend. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, I, sorry. You can't call me doctor. It's just Chris. Oh, okay. I don't let anybody oh, call, Chris, call me oh, Dr. Oh, Dara, Joanne. Okay. Please call me Chris. Okay. I, I just don't go. I don't, I don't let do anybody that. call me doctor. Yeah, no, I was going <laughs> to, actually, I was going to call you Chris, and then I thought, oh, no, that, that's not formal enough. <laughs> no, thank you. Call me Chris. So, Chris, I have a friend that has macular degeneration, and she's being treated at the Mayo Clinic. Um, and I don't think most people understand what it is to begin with. So, you know, a lot of our listeners, they may have heard the term, but they don't know what it is. So in just a few sentences, yep. explain what it is, because it sounds, you know, from when she describes her treatment, it's pretty horrendous. So, Yes, so the macula is the central retina. It accounts for our central 10 degrees of vision. The When you look at something, that image, you know, whatever you're looking directly at, that lands on, that image lands on your macula, and that's, so that allows, the macula allows you to, to read, to see people's faces, to see stop signs, things like that. And that is unfortunately the part of the eye that tends to degenerate the most um, in these conditions. And um, let me just say that worldwide today, um, 8.69% of the people over the age of 50 have macular degeneration. That's one in 11 people over the age of 50, and it is around 29 to possibly 32% of the population over age 75. So that is nearly one in three worldwide are are, are affected with macular degeneration. So the wow. so wow. it's 196 million people affected this year but if you want me to go back i mean we can talk about this but historically this disease was incredibly rare wow Wow. and that's interesting we'd love to talk more about that at the other side of our break so you are listening to dishing up nutrition brought to you by nutritional weight and wellness and today we are discussing how eating real food supports eye health and good vision with dr chris kenobi author of ancestral dietary strategy to prevent and treat macular degeneration. He has such great information to share, and we will be right back. Are you wondering or perhaps worried about how you're going to stay healthy during this very stressful time? As many of you have guessed, we recommend eating real food in balance several times a day. And that's easy to say, but challenging to say the least. There's never been a more important time than right now to get your nutrition right. I'd like to suggest signing up for our personalized wellness package of one-on-one appointments with one of our weight and wellness nutritionists or dietitians. That means that could be Joanne. It could be. Or one of the other 10 people. (laughs) So for the month of December, 
you can save $135 on your package of personalized wellness appointments and you can get your nutrition back on track. So just call 651-699-3438 or you can go online at Weight and Wellness to sign up. That's so right. now we're back talking. Long we're break, back. I thought. It was kind of a long break. <laughs> so we're back talking to Dr. Chris Kenobi. Your book um, goes into detail about how people ate 100 years ago. And you were just talking about how rare macular degeneration was compared to now. And I remember hearing you speak about three years ago. I was so impressed to hear how new the disease of macular degeneration really is. Um, so I think your, the statement you made today was really important. You said eating right to save your sight is um, a great rule to live by. And, and it affects everything else that you do. It all does. The rest of, of your health. And all the other parts of health. Exactly. So talk more about how rare that disease is. Yes. So the incredible thing was when I began to do this research, I knew that if when I asked myself back in 2013, if macular degeneration might be driven by man-made processed foods like all this other disease, then one, two things had to be true. One is, is that the disease had to be rare when we didn't have processed foods. And I didn't really know when that was. And, Mm -hmm. and, you know, um, and, and number two really was is that I, uh, I, I mean, that the, the disease would have to increase in prevalence as those foods were consumed, right? And right. so I had to investigate the history of macular degeneration, and I had no clue about this because in medicine, this is never taught about any disease. Right. And oh. uh, <laughs> anyway, so when I went back, I literally spent months, uh, Dara and Joanne, going, uh, investigating just the history of macular degeneration. But in, in a nutshell, between 1851, when this disease was first discoverable, because ophthalmologists then had uh, ophthalmoscopes and they could begin to see back into the retina. And in and and the next 80 years, till about 1930, there was no more than about 50 Five zero fifty 50 cases of macular degeneration in all of the world's literature. And believe me, wow. Wow. I've read so many texts and papers from that era. And this disease was extraordinarily rare. In fact, I think there was far fewer than 50. But anyway, um, whereas today there's 196 million in the world, right? And so while the population increased fivefold, the, the elevation in macular degeneration it literally increased infinitely right Mm -hmm. and so but what happened was is we got processed foods and what were those again sugar refined uh uh refined carbohydrates refined wheat mostly in the united states vegetable oils and trans fats and those were you know we've had sugar in the diet for centuries but it was really low consumption um you know until the late 19th century um and then we got refined wheat flour beginning in 1880, which is a nutrient deficient food, and then vegetable oils right after the American Civil War introduced in 1866, and then trans fats introduced with Crisco wow. by yeah. Procter & Gamble in 1911. So put those four foods together, and over the next 100 and, um, you know, however you want to look at it, over about the next 135 years, um, by 2009, those four foods, and I use the term loosely, n- occupied 63% of the American diet. So these, these foods began to uh, um, supplant and replace uh, nat- our natural whole foods, right? Mm-hmm. And so this leads to, now you have nutrient deficiency and you have toxicity, and we can talk further about that. But So, you know, one of the but, things that I hear, and I've heard this a little bit from a oh, We'll come right back to that. We have to go on another break. Joanne, go ahead. Okay, so you're listening to Dishing Up Nutrition. Did our genetics change over the past 100 years? Or what has changed? Let's be realistic. Um, one thing that we have to help you out is we you can start cooking recipes from our Weight and Wellness Way cookbook and nutrition guide. And for the month of December, we're offering a savings of 15% for this easy-to-use cookbook. And we'll be right back. Well, welcome back to Dishing Up Nutrition. Dr. Chris Kenobi shared many important health facts in his book 
ancestral dietary strategies to prevent and treat macular degeneration. So I want to share a couple of things that he put in his book that I thought was kind of, hmm, kind of eye-opening. So more than, he said, more than 20 studies clearly show that elderly people with high cholesterol live longer than older people with low cholesterol. So do we have to be worrying about our cholesterol all the time? And then another one he shared was nine studies have shown that high cholesterol is not a risk factor for disease or the even the arteries in our legs and in our heart. So cholesterol is not a risk factor. And then there were 30 studies that showed that people who had suffered a heart attack or stroke had not eaten more saturated fat than those without heart attacks or strokes. So those are just three findings about health and cholesterol and saturated fat that Dr. Kenobi shared in his book. You know, you can't imagine how much work he put into this book. Right. I mean, it's incredible. Right. And we know how much work it is just putting together a radio show. Exactly. Let alone a, a book like his. So, you know, it's some of the same information that we teach all the time in our classes. And I think a couple of classes that we have that you might be interested in taking is building a better working memory. Uh, I think as you get older, everybody's concerned about that. And then right now, another great class is your energy solution, real food. We keep going back to real food all the time. Mm-hmm. So if you're interested, call 651-699-3438 and we'll help you sign up for a class. You don't even have to do all the work. So let's go back to genetics. Yes. So... You know, that's one of the things, Chris, that I hear all the time from people. Well, it's a genetic problem. I can't do anything about it. So, Mm -hmm. you know, dig into that a little bit for us and help people understand it's more than genetics. Yes. Well, so, um, you know, the, um, the, the orthodox allopathic view has been that macular degeneration is a disease of aging and genetics and um, you know but if that's the case then the disease should have had the same prevalence um, you know a hundred years ago as it as it Mm -hmm. does today right Right. exactly and so let me just say this in a broad in broad strokes the the evolutionary biologists have told us found out that the spontaneous mutate mutation rate for DNA is about 0.5% per million, <clears throat> per million years. Oh, wow. So that means that DNA mutations over 10,000 years, if you start doing the math, is 0.005%. Okay, what would, that means <laughs> that the DNA mutations over 100 years is 0.00005%. Wow. Right? Four, point, and then four zeros and five. <laughs> That's how I remember that. Mm-hmm. So that, so it's, it's in almost impossible that our DNA has changed at all in the last hundred or even two or three hundred years, right? And so, um, so, so that, so, but the, so the DNA, the bl- your architectural blueprint hasn't changed, but what can change is is your epigenetics, okay. and that means turning on and turning off genes. And how do you do that? And you do that with food. And how does the food do it? It does it primarily through vitamins. Mm-hmm. Well, vitamins and other cofactors, but you know, but primarily uh, vitamins. So when you have nutrient deficiencies, for example, then you are affecting your the way that your genes are functioning. You're not changing your your genetic blueprint, your DNA necessarily, but you're changing the way those genes. Um, are turned on or turned off. So, so Chris, did I answer the question? Yeah, but I've got a little more, Chris. Um, I often hear from clients or people that have macular gener- de- degeneration is that, yeah, but my mother had it or my sister had it or my grandmother had it, uh, so it has to be genetic. I mean, it has to be just in my genes. It's So how do you, how do you go back and say, well, yeah, but, 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 so... Would you go through that maybe again? Because that's the one thing that it's almost like people say, 
well, it's in my family, so I can't do anything about it. Yes, and and that's a that's definitely a valid question. And but the the fact is, is to get right to the meat of this, the way I would answer is, I would say that the the primary thing that we inherit is our way of eating. <laughs> and you, you, you be, that begins the day you're born or before, really. But, yes. but and so if you, if you, for example, with these diseases, these chronic diseases like heart, you know, heart disease, uh, Alzheimer's disease, age-related macular degeneration, they don't h- hardly ever hit people that are 30 or even 35 years old. And so, but if a guy is born and, and you know, begins to eat processed foods, and he's still not going to, and he, he consumes those his whole life. He's still not going to have a heart attack until he's maybe 40 or 50 years old, mm-hmm. get, you know, mm-hmm. get Alzheimer's until he's maybe 60 plus. And the same for macular degeneration. Okay. And um, so uh, I think I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> um, oh, that's great. You're human. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, anyway, go ahead. Um, well, no, I think that explains it uh, very well. It's And it's hard for people to wrap their head around that, that it is really related to what you're putting in your mouth and getting into your bloodstream, the nutrients and everything. It makes a difference with every part of your health, you know, whether it's your yeah. eyes or your heart or your whatever it is. Okay, let me interject. Now okay. it came back to me. Okay. Uh, now my EEG is working again. Uh, <laughs> not flat. Uh, so, all right. So with macular degeneration specifically, we looked at this. And if you put all the data together, if you have all of the worst possible genetics, you put them all together uh, for macular degeneration, you would, on average, develop the wet form of macular degeneration, you know, the worst possible form. Mm-hmm. Something like, I think it was 5.4 years earlier than somebody that had none of the genetic uh, uh, tendencies for macular degeneration. So it's not like somebody with really terrible genetics gets macular degeneration when they're 30 years old and the people with the good genetics get it when they're 85. That's not the way it works at all. Mm-hmm. And so again, what we see is is that um, it, it's really that you're you're inheriting mostly bad food habits. Uh, consumption habits. Yes. Mm-hmm. And you in, sort of inherit those, if you will, from your parents. And you have to recognize that, that even if you grew up eating processed foods and junk foods and, and your, you know, your mom or dad thought that Crisco was good and vegetable oils are good, um, because that's the way it is. That's, you know, that's how my parents were because they bought into this. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, right. right. And so you keep doing the same thing. And now, you know, now all of a sudden you're twenties, thirties, fifties, whatever. And you start getting these diseases. Maybe you're gaining weight and you're developing, you know, the risks for heart disease or, or whatever, or, or macular degeneration. And what you really have inherited is that eating pattern. You have to, you have to change that. So, Chris, one of the things that I also hear from clients and friends is, well, you know, we caught, we cooked real food when we were growing up. But I know in your book, you kind of zeroed in on about five different foods. And maybe we should talk about that because, you know, you said white flour. Right. Mm-hmm. And But well, what does that do? What does white flour do? What is that slice of bread? Let's get it down to, you know, it's that toast that you have in the morning, especially if it's dry toast. You know, how does that maybe break down your health in some way or another? Right. So if you just take uh, wheat or flour alone, so in the, the entire world could only have whole grain wheat up until the year 1880. And that year was the year that roller mill technology was introduced. And roller mill technology could shear away the bran and germ of wheat and give us a completely refined white flour. Well, what does that mean? When you shear away the bran and the germ, you're removing the B vitamins, E vitamins, fiber minerals, omega-3 and omega-6 fats. And what that now what you have is a nutrient deficient food. And um, so this contributes to your nutrient deficiencies. And in 1879, 
We consume twice as much wheat in the United States as we did 100 years later in 1979. And so these authors that say, well, this is all about wheat, no, I don't really believe it's, it's the wheat in and of itself is mm-hmm. necessarily the problem. It's the right. fact that in the United States today, wheat is about 20% of our diet. It's 20% of the world's diet. And in the United States, 85.3% of that recently was determined to be refined white wheat flour, meaning Mm -hmm. that that means 17% of the American's diet right there is nutrient deficient food, which is kind of like sugar, just no nutrients. That's the big part of it. So interesting. Yeah, it is. So let's talk, let's maybe Chris could talk a little bit about, right. What about the sugar? And the high fructose corn syrup. I mean, you talked about white flour being kind of like sugar now, but what about sugar itself and the high fructose corn syrup? Right. So I, you know, I think uh, sugar. Um, I'm not going to defend sugar. Sugar is twenty twenty one percent of the American diet today. Um, if you looked back three hundred years ago, it was almost zero. Um, mm-hmm. We wow. consume twenty grams of sugar in 1865 in the United States. And uh, by uh, 1999, we were at our uh, the pinnacle of, of sugar consumption, and it was something like 140 grams per person per day. Wow. In other words, sugar between 1822 and 1999 went up 17-fold. Oh. Sugar is a nutrient-deficient food. There's no micronutrients, no vitamins, no minerals. So, so here we go. So we've got wheat, 17% of the, of the diet being nutrient deficient. Sugar, 21% of the diet being nutrient deficient. I think that right there is the biggest problem with it. Now, sugar can drive uh, and, and contribute to metabolic disease, certainly yeah. when, the, when the dose is really high, but it has to be really high um, to, to, you know, to get to the level where it's damaging to the liver and so forth and contributing to diabetes. Well, you know, you know, you say really high, and we have clients who come in that's been drinking uh, six cokes a day or ten cokes a day, or mm-hmm. you know, and it's it's really easy to get to that really high damaging effect of just high fructose corn syrup or sugar. Oh gosh, at that level, that that's just a recipe for disaster. You know, you're <laughs> oh, yeah. nutrient deficient, and you're adding to. You're just severely adding to your risk of metabolic syndrome, and and at that at those levels, if you're drinking that much sugar, that 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 would be uh, potentially severe risk. So the other one that I think would really inter- in- interesting and important to talk about is the vegetable oils. I mean, we talk about it all the time, over and over on the show. But, you know, the soybean oil, the corn oil, the cottonseed, all those. And yes. how does that go about damaging your eyes? Yes. So there is, um, I, I, let me just say, first of all, I think that Americans, I think the world is obsessed with <laughs> using oils. And uh, to, uh, to get to the bottom line here, I, you know, I am now telling people, I think the easiest thing to do is just eliminate all oils from your diet and use traditional animal fats, which means for most people, just use 100% grass-fed butter for all of your cooking. We love everything. It. We love it. And so, and the, but the damaging oils, they are just so people know, they are soybean, corn, canola, cottonseed, rapeseed, grapeseed, sunflower, safflower, and rice bran. Rice bran. You can see I've said that a million times. <laughs> yes. And the, but those oils, those account for about 97 to 98 percent of the oils in the American diet, and you really could almost throw olive oil in there because 79% of olive oil in the United States is adulterated with these cheap oils. People don't know it. They think they're getting good olive oil, and they're not. They're getting adulterated olive oil, and I don't care what the label says. I don't trust hardly any of them. I hate to say it. But, okay, the question is, is what do these do to us? These oils, these contain huge amounts of omega-6 fats, and that omega-6 fat primarily is linoleic acid, 18-carbon omega-6 fat. These fats accumulate in our fats. They accumulate in our cell membranes. They accumulate in our mitochondria, or the powerhouses of the cell, and they are pro-oxidative, meaning they cause oxidation. This is like rusting inside the body, in, in a sense. They are pro-inflammatory. 
meaning they drive all they drive a severe level of inflammation. They are toxic. We can come back to that. And they are nutrient deficient. They don't have vitamins A, D, and K2 like the healthy animal fats, like butter, for example. All right, so you put all that mixed together, pro-oxidative, pro-inflammatory, toxic, and nutrient deficient. Now you've got the perfect storm, the perfect recipe to maim uh, you maim you to to malign your metabolism uh, and to drive all of the diseases of civilization. Ultimately, these seed oils are cytotoxic, meaning they kill cells directly. Directly, they're genotoxic, meaning they alter gene function. They're mutagenic, meaning they mutate DNA. Carcinogenic, atherogenic, meaning wow. they're they're inducing atherosclerosis. They are uh, obesogenic, meaning they induce <laughs> obesity, right? How can yeah. it get any worse? It and can't. what are we told to, to avoid? Saturated fat. Exactly. You know, the, the one fat, you know, the, the saturated fat and the monounsaturated fat, like you would get primarily in a good, nice grass-fed steak, those are incredibly healthy. And the the polyunsaturated fat, the omega six in steak, is extremely low. And I give you some numbers if you want. Okay. So that's well, it. We would nutshell. love to get more of that as soon as we come back from break. Chris, you did a great job. That thanks. was amazing. <laughs> what a mouthful, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you are Thank listening you. to Dishing Up Nutrition, brought to you by Nutritional Weight and Wellness. There are thirteen essential vitamins that you that are critical to every human being, and you just mentioned some of those, including fat soluble vitamin. A, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K, plus all the water-soluble vitamins, all the B vitamins, and vitamin C. So research has found that 34% of the U.S. adult population was below the recommended level for vitamin A, and 74% were below the recommended level for vitamin D. And wild-caught salmon's a good food source for both vitamin A and D, Supplementing with two teaspoons of a high-quality cod liver oil um, and a high-quality vitamin D daily is also recommended. If you have any more questions about any of these vitamins or supplements, they're available at all seven Twin City Metro locations. So call 651-699-3438. And we will be right back. Well, well, welcome back to Dishing Up Nutrition. What a great show this is. Definitely. (laughs) So um, just welcome back. We're going to continue our conversation. And I think, Joanne, we were going to continue a little bit more questions about fats, right? A little bit more information about fat. You were talking about the polyunsaturated and hydrogenated and how toxic they are. And did you have any other information to add on that? Sure. So, um, yeah. Do we have four hours? <laughs> I wish. I wish. <laughs> you're, hey, Chris, you're okay. coming back. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get you back. We can't, we haven't gotten through half of what we want to talk about today. <laughs> I have so much to say. Okay, <laughs> let, me, great. let me do this very quickly, though. All right. All natural fats have three kinds of fats, saturated fat, monounsaturated fat, and polyunsaturated fat. So if you take, for example, a T-bone steak, from a grass-fed cow, which is fantastically healthy, by the way, um, <laughs> these the, yes. you might have around 46%, somewhere in this range, saturated fat, maybe 52% monounsaturated fat. Realize these numbers vary. They're not the same from animal to animal. and It depends and, on and what they change. eat. Yes, mm-hmm. it depends on what they eat and their age and all kinds of things. So I'm just giving you some ballpark ideas. And that animal might also have about 2% polyunsaturated fat. What is the polyunsaturated fat or the PUFAs? That is omega-6 and omega-3 together. All right? Now, mm-hmm. okay. okay, 2%. Keep that in mind, ladies and gentlemen. And so now think about this. The seed oils, they could range anywhere from a and I'm going to include olive oil here for a moment. They could range anywhere from around 2%. Uh, total PUFA or omega-6 and omega-3 up to around 75 or 80 percent PUFAs, right? So you cannot get all natural foods are very low in the PUFAs, right? And so, but the only, but these vegetable oils, they're not natural. 
And so in, on average, you're probably going to get in the range of 30 to 55 percent PUFAs or this omega, you know, um, not quite that high omega-6, but the PUFAs in these, these uh, vegetable oils. So, for example, soybean oil is 55 percent PUFA, polyunsaturated fat. And Chris, why that is that a problem? That is enormous. Yeah, because so again, so then if you think about this, if we were if if you were only eating um, healthy raised animal fats, most of those are going to are going to have PUFAs down in the range of around two percent. Whereas if you're getting thirty or fifty percent of the of the fat in a vegetable oil being PUFA, now those are accumulating. That omega six is accumulating in your fat and in your cells and your cell membranes and your mitochondria, and is again we're going back to now it's going to drive this pro oxidative, pro inflammatory, toxic effects, and mm-hmm. it's going to be destructive to the mitochondrial function, and the mitochondria, your energy powerhouse of the cell, is going to become dysfunctional. And what will happen is is that you will begin to lose energy, you'll begin to lose weight, I mean, you'll begin to gain weight because those cells will begin to store that fat because they can't properly burn fats for fuel now. The energy productions will shut down in the cell. That leads to things like cancers, uh, cell death, which leads to neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, macular degeneration, and the metabolic dysfunction leads to insulin resistance, which drives metabolic syndrome, which drives non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, <laughs> type 2 diabetes. Um, and then, and the, the cellular failure leads to heart failure. So, I, again, I just go on and on, but the ramifications are just enormous. And this is exactly what's also driving macular degeneration. One of the things in macular degeneration that parallels all these other diseases is they're all tied together by mitochondrial dysfunction, which is driven by too much omega-6 fat. And that's what all these... So again, it's interesting, but why would atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, heart failure, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, and macular degeneration, why would they have mitochondrial dysfunction? They all have it because they're tied together because... Omega six fats are driving all of this primarily. Wow, that's wow. Great. So, Chris, well, I know we only have about two minutes, but okay. would you talk about cataracts? Because everyone says that they have to have cataract surgery. You know, I'm eighty two. Yes, and I don't have cataracts yet. Right. I'll yeah. wait until I'm a hundred. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to say that. Let me qualify this because I have not done uh, uh, original research on this and cataracts. But okay. in general, I would say that we do know that uh, things like smoking and type two diabetes, um, you know, drives much earlier cataracts. And so, in a in a sense, cataracts are driven by pro oxidative, pro inflammatory effects and pro- and nutrient deficiencies as well. So we're kind of coming back to that. So Definitely an ancestral diet like you're following, Dar, and we're all, I'm sure all of us are following. Right, but right. Anyway, though, that is the, by far the best way to try to prevent cataracts. Um, and it isn't, not everyone has to have cataracts. I mean, right. that's, I, a, that's another thing that I think people believe that just as they get older, they have to have cataracts. Right. And I've always heard a strong sugar connection <clears throat> to cataracts as right. well. Right. Yeah, and I think that comes back to the fact that it's going to, you know, the, the the people eating a lot of sugar, they're usually consuming seed oils, too, because they're consuming yes. processed foods. Yeah. They go together. Right. True. So you're driving all that at the same time. Right. Chris, you have been just a fantastic guest. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Oh, We'd love to have you back. Thank you, Joanne and Dar. It's really been an honor and a pleasure. So our goal is to help each and every person experience better health through eating real food. A simple yet powerful message. Eating real food is life-changing. Thank you for listening. Have a safe and healthy holiday season. Thanks for listening to Dishing Up Nutrition. If you enjoy this podcast, please share your favorite episodes with a friend or leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or iHeartRadio. The content and opinions expressed are those of the hosts or presenters. They are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. Product statements have not been evaluated by the FDA.